Hey everyone, welcome back to the second session on healing our wounds. In this session, we're gonna be talking about how we can actually be healed. In the first session, we talked about identifying our woundedness. And so hopefully you've had some time to reflect on your own story where you can have a sense of, okay, here are my wounds. Here are some of the broken parts of my story, different things I've suffered. Because we need to know what has happened to us first. We have to identify our wounds in order to actually be healed. So maybe you're thinking, okay, I know my story. I know what's happened to me, but I'm not healed and I don't know how to. Well, that's what we're gonna be diving into in this session. So I just wanna recall last week for a second. We touched on the fact that we are made for communion. God created Adam and Eve and called the two to intimacy, to relationship, to love. We are hardwired in our bones for communion. And so much so that when we're not in communion with others, when we're not participating in love, we feel lost. We feel like we don't belong. This is what John Paul II says about love. He says, man cannot live without love. He remains a being that is incomprehensible for himself. His life is senseless if love is not revealed to him, if he does not encounter love, if he does not experience it and make it his own, if he does not participate intimately in it. He's saying we, we need love. It's not just an option, we actually need it. And when we don't have it, we don't know what life's all about. I mean, think of the greatest moments of your life. The greatest moments are often in times of communion. Think of the worst moments of your life, the darkest moments, oftentimes moments of isolation where we feel alone or lonely. So we are made for love because love and communion is actually what heals our woundedness. So in the beginning before sin, they were naked and they felt no shame. There was perfect communion and perfect trust. Woundedness did not exist then, but they doubted the goodness of the fatherhood of God and they grasp at the fruit because they lack trust in God. And that's when they hid themselves. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And John Paul II says in this moment, this first wound, this original sin, this necessity of hiding oneself, John Paul II says, shows the fundamental lack of trust, which already in itself points to the collapse of the original relationship of communion. In the beginning, they had perfect trust in one another. But with sin, with woundedness, we begin to lack trust. And then it makes us not live in the fullness of communion with one another. And this is what our woundedness does. When we are hurt, we start doubting that we're loved or wanted. We begin to lack trust in God. We feel like he's abandoned us or rejected us. Same with other people. And so we have to allow love and communion, the truth of love and communion in those places to redeem trust primarily in God first. So if we recall Dr. Bob Schutz's tree model on healing, he basically says this, if we want to live joyful lives, if we want to live free fruits of the Holy Spirit filled lives, we need to go down to the root system of like a tree. If we want good fruit, we have to go down to the root system and we need to be grounded in a proper identity, which is what? To be grounded in love, that we are beloved. When we're secure in that before God, that we're beloved, we can then mature Security gives rise, gives rise to maturity, and maturity gives rise to purity. This is from Dr. Bob Schutz. So if we're having bad fruit come out, bitterness, resentment, resentment, destructive behavior, sinful behavior, it's because there's something in our root system, something about our identity that is wounded, that we're living out of certain lies. And so I honestly want to just share with you my journey of healing and hopefully it will help equip you to begin your own. So about five years ago, I was struggling. I was bitter. I was resentful. I was sad. I was angry and I was going in the chapel all the time and asking God why. I was asking God why. And he invited me to go to counseling. 
And what I learned was all of these symptoms weren't meant to harm me, but they're meant to help me. They're meant to be clues for me to discover the deeper problems. So I'm meant to be like a detective in this counseling session to look at these clues, to find the roots, to find the source. And I'm going through these counseling and I found, find out that one of my greatest wounds is rejection. And we all have our different story. Maybe it's abandonment or fear or powerlessness. Mine was rejection. And if you asked me five years ago, Brendan, have you ever been bullied before? I would honestly say like, no, no. Through counseling, I discovered I have been bullied and pretty bad. I remember when I was in sixth grade, I was playing outside in the front yard with my brother and a couple of his friends. And I'm five foot, like a hundred pounds. I'm skinny, I'm scrawny. And they decide to pin me down in the middle of the yard. And it's all fun and games, but then I'm like, hey, let me go, let me go. And they're just laughing and laughing and pinning me down harder. And now I'm yelling, let me go, let me go. And I'm feeling powerless. I'm actually starting to get scared. And I somehow get one of my legs loose and I kick one of them in between the legs and I get free and I start running in our neighborhood and I turn around and one of my brother's friends is sprinting after me mad and I am sprinting and sprinting and I somehow make it into my house and I'm just crying and I run to my mom and she just hugs me and I'm just crying and I feel powerless, I feel weak, I feel like I'm not seen. Well, fast forward into high school the very first day of high school, I haven't hit puberty yet, almost. <laughs> I got my backpack on, five foot three, first day, and I'm running around the corner, and I hit someone, and yogurt sprays all over him. And I look up, and it's the lead gang member in the school. He's got a black belt, drug dealer, you don't mess with him. And I am so scared, and he starts cussing me out, verbally bullying and cussing me out. And I squirm off, see ya. <laughs> but somewhere in my heart, I felt that same wound of powerlessness, of being weak. And I remembered in high school, you know, us guys, we would make fun of one another and poke fun, put each other in headlocks. But for me, it became more personal because of those small wounds. And so I'm realizing this is coming to the surface in my counseling that, wow, I've I've kind of been bullied a little bit. And I remembered one night when I was doing counseling a few years ago, I, I had a dream and in the dream, I was being pinned down. Let me go, let me go. I wake up out of this dream and I start crying for like five minutes straight, like wailing, crying. And I, I felt just, I was like shaking. And I was freaked out because I'd never woken up from a dream crying like that in my life. And I remember talking to a priest friend. I was like, what the heck was that? He's like, Brendan, that's a sign of healing. It's a sign of healing of that part of your heart. You have to grieve. Oftentimes when we're wounded, we try to just hold it together. We try to just be like stonewalled, like I'm not gonna feel it. A part of the healing process is we have to feel, we have to grieve those parts of our hearts that have been hurt. And so I remember I've been bullied, that's been brutal rejection of my life. I've also been cheated on, I've been betrayed by certain friends and other girls where this deep lie has sunk into my heart, you're not wanted. And I lived out of the lie, you have to be perfect in order to be loved. You have to perform very, very well, and then you'll finally be wanted. And it's self-reliant, and it is tiring. And so this counseling culminated on a healing retreat I went to with Dr. Bob Schutz in Florida. It's called Healing the Whole Person. It's a retreat. And I remember going on this retreat and I was just, I'm like, I know my story. I see these deep wounds I've been through with rejection. And I pray, and someone prayed with me on that retreat. And they were praying with me and praying with me and said, let's just ask the Holy Spirit what 
he wants to reveal. And I'm just feeling and feeling, I'm like, you know what, I'm, I'm just, I'm frustrated right now. And the person's like, that's okay, that's okay. Let's just see what the Holy Spirit wants to bring up. And on my mind, out of the blue, was my mom. She kind of came to the surface. And the person said, what are you thinking when you're seeing your mom in your mind? And I'm like, my mom, she's suffered a lot of depression in her life. And sometimes I haven't know how to deal with it. And the person praying with me just simply said, Brendan, I, I think you've been through trauma. And right when she said the word trauma, it was as if I felt it. That I would never have related certain wounds in my life, my mom's depression, to traumatic for me. I would never have labeled it like that, but she said it. And for some reason, I felt it. And I felt it and I felt it. And all of a sudden, it was as if something lifted in my heart that I began to see my mom more with compassion and love towards her. And I began to go on this retreat and looking at the women, looking at the people who have betrayed or rejected me, I, I wasn't just shaming them, revengeful thoughts and feelings. It was more compassion, con passio, the Latin means to suffer with. I began to have mercy in my heart towards them. And I realized, okay, this is healing. This is healing. You know, I, re I remember after this retreat, I actually had a FaceTime call with who's been my mentor, Christopher West. And I was just like, Christopher, like, I am so broken. I feel like I have so many different wounds. Like, I'm like broken. And he's just laughing. I'm like, you're laughing. What, why are you laughing for? And he's like, oh, Brendan, you are so much more broken than you think. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> He's like, but brother, the Lord loves you right there. And that's freeing. We are so broken more than we think, but we are loved right there. We don't have to clean up our mess. We don't have to get everything put together in order to be loved, that we can be free. We can trust in him. We can trust in him with our wounds and with our brokenness. And we need to open to his love and to his communion so that we can be restored in our identity. So how can we be healed? Well, I often talk about the three R's for healing. The three R's are receiving God's love and communion and love and communion for others. from others. We need to receive love and communion. We need to reconcile with God, ourself, and others. And we need to renounce the lies and announce the truths. I'm gonna say that one more time. To be healed, we need to receive love and communion in those dark, wounded places of our hearts. We need to reconcile, forgive those that have hurt us. We need to reconcile with God, ourself, and others. And we need to renounce the lies and announce the truths. I renounce the lie in Jesus' name that I'm not wanted. And I announce the truth in Jesus' name that I'm wanted. Because honestly, for unforgiveness and lies are like gasoline that S Satan puts on our woundedness to just make it burn and make it burn. We need to forgive, which is a heroic act. You know, we're, we're justified to say, you hurt me. Like, that's not fair. Like, you took something from me. Like, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That's the Old Testament. But heroic love, in order to, for ourselves to ultimately be free, we have to see what they've taken from us. Like I said, grieve it and feel it and release them from the debt that they owe us. Forgiveness, it's heroic love. So forgiveness and also renouncing the lies and announcing the truths. So I'm gonna conclude by sharing a small clip that I love to share when it comes to the healing journey and how we can apply those three R's to it. The show is The Prince of Bel-Air and you probably have seen the scene because it's super popular, but the scene depicts Will, who is the main actor in The Prince of Bel-Air well, he was abandoned when he was a kid by his father. 
and he grew up being raised by Uncle Phil. And in this scene, Will is now 16 years old and his father comes. He's back and he's like, Will, I'm back. I'm your father. And he starts promising him vacations and promising a relationship to him. And Will is getting all excited. And so Will packs his suitcases to take a trip with his dad. And while he's packing his suitcase, his dad goes over to Uncle Phil and says, hey, I actually got to leave real quick. Can you just tell Will for me? I got some business. And Uncle Phil's like, I'm not going to do your dirty work. You tell him yourself. And he's like, I'll just call him on the road. And Uncle Phil's like, yeah, you do that then. And so Will's dad, Lou, is now walking out of the door. But then Will rushes in and says, Daddy-o, what's up? How you doing? And his dad turns around and walks over to Will and says, you know, Will, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to put our trip on hold. You understand, don't you, son? And Will's like, yeah, okay, okay. And he's like, it's great to see you, son. He's like, you too, Lou. And his dad walks out. And Will starts kind of joking and joking. And Uncle Phil is like, Will, Will, it's, it's, it's all right to be angry. And Will's like, why should I be mad? At least he said goodbye this time. And Uncle Phil's like, if there's anything I could do, he's like, you don't need to do nothing, Uncle Phil. Ain't like I'm still five years old, you know? Ain't like I'm going to be sitting up every night asking mom, when's daddy coming home, you know? Who needs him? He wasn't there to teach me how to shoot my first basket, but I learned, didn't I? I got pretty dang good at it too, didn't I? I learned how to drive. I learned how to shave. I learned how to fight without him. I spent 14 great birthdays without him. He never even sent me a dang card to hell with him. I didn't need him then. I don't need him now. He's like, you know what, Uncle Phil? I'm going to get through college without him. I'm going to get a great job without him. Marry me a beautiful wife. Have me a whole bunch of kids. I'm going to be a better father than he ever was because I sure as heck don't need him for that. There ain't a dang thing he could ever teach me about how to love my kids. And Uncle Phil is just looking at Will who is in pain and he's just looking at him with love and compassion. And Will just breaks down. How come he doesn't want me, man? How come he doesn't want me, man? And Uncle Phil just embraces him, loves him, right in that place of hurt. And the journey that Will needs to go on, <laughs> that we all need to go on in our place, was for Will, it was abandonment. How come he doesn't want me? Maybe he's believing that lie, I'm not wanted. We have to renounce the lies, especially when we are feeling it the most. Certain days we might be believing and living out of lies. I renounce the lie that I'm not wanted. And I announce the truth that I am beloved, that I am enough. Will would need to renounce those lies and announce the truth. He would need to reconcile, forgive his father for everything he's done. And that might take years and years and years and years. But that's the journey. And to receive love in communion. That was the embrace of Uncle Phil. These are the three R's. This is kind of a tool for our own healing journey. So what is your story? Where are the parts of your heart that you need to allow love and communion? First, God's love and communion. What parts of your heart do you need to forgive others and reconcile? And what parts of your heart do you need to renounce the lies and announce the truth? Pope Benedict says this, when we go to prayer and we go before perfect love himself, which is where we have perfect trust and we can take our wounds. Pope Benedict says this, before Jesus' gaze, all falsehood melts away. All falsehood melts away. All of those lies we believe melts away when we are before perfect love. This encounter, as it burns us, transforms us and frees us, allowing us to become truly ourselves, his gaze the touch of his heart heals us through an undeniably painful transformation as through fire. But it is a blessed pain in which the holy power of his love sears through us like a flame, enabling us to become totally ourselves and totally of God. 
the part where we open our darkness and our wounds and we allow perfect love in is going to hurt because we're holding on to those lies. We're holding on to those false beliefs. And at times, those false beliefs feel like home because we've been holding on to it for 10 years, 20 years. They feel like home. And releasing those lies is going to be painful. But it is a blessed pain, Pope Benedict says, because it allows us to become free and totally ourselves. Lord, open our eyes, open our hearts. Give us the grace. Give us the grace to come before you and trust that you want to heal us. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen.